We do not serve a man-made God. We are so blessed to serve a God that loves us and desires us, who wants us to come to him. Praise you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Let me look over the calendar here just real briefly, see if there's anything I need to remind you of. Sunday, Pastor Dan. Next Thursday night, 6 o'clock, the Jesus Revolution movie. I don't know if you've heard about that movie. It was out in theaters. We did purchase it, and we will be showing it here. Jeremy, how long is that movie? Okay, that movie is two hours. I do believe that the pastor is planning to show it in its fullness. So I would say that next Thursday night we will come in, start the movie immediately so that you can get out of here at a, at a decent time. But please come and see the movie. It's really good. I, Jeremy and I have seen it twice. And we also now own it, I believe. Yeah, so... We like it. (laughs) We enjoyed it. So please come out, bring a friend. That's a great way to bring someone to church without bringing someone to church. (laughs) You know, you could say, hey, this movie was out, popular movie. You know, watch the trailer, look it up, share with them about it, and then invite them to come see it. So it's a a good way for someone to get a feel for what Victory Fellowship is like and and the people here, the warmness of the people here. So just try to invite someone to come see it. And then for those who are going to Sight and Sound on the 21st, we will be leaving at 7.30 that morning. And I think that's a... No, that is to be announced yet, I believe. Do we know where we're leaving from? Walmart. The Walmart parking lot. So, we will pull out at 7.30, promptly, on the 21st. And the van is full, correct? Okay. Okay. Any other announcements? So, God said, towards the end of his word to us, put your hand in my hand. And if you look at your paper for this evening, you can see that we're going to be talking about hands. We're going to talk a little bit about our hands. We're going to talk a little bit about Jesus' hands. And we're going to talk about God's hands. So praise the Lord. I felt like that was confirmation for the message this evening. Does everyone have a paper? It is on the front and back. So God has been talking to me a lot about his hand, about his hand being upon me, about his hand being in my life. So I thought I would just share with you a little bit about what I've been learning about from God. Okay, and tonight I did it in the pastor fashion, and he's not even here to see it, I did it like him tonight. So, someone please tell him, when you see him, (laughs) that I typed it all up. (laughs) Okay. Let's see here. Okay. So, the word hand is found in the Bible approximately 1,466 times. The word, was anybody surprised at that? Because I was. I was too. The word hands, with an S, is found in the Bible approximately 462 times. The words right hand are found in the Bible approximately 132 times. So, the word hand, hands, right hand in the Bible a lot, a lot. The right hand symbolizes the hand of blessing, mercy, and honor. Jesus sits at the right 
hand of the Father. In Matthew 25, 31 through 46, in this parable about the sheep and the goats, the sheep are on the right and the goats are on the left. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, the place of honor. Judges 20, 16. Because once I, I realized just how many times in the Bible the word hand and hands are used in there, I got to thinking about what about left hand? You know, what, does it talk, ever talk about left hand or ambidextrous? Or, because that, in my family, we have some left-handed people. So I was just curious. So you know how one thing just kind of leads to another when you start looking, in, looking at things. Okay, so I did find in Judges 2016, among all these soldiers, there were 700 select troops who were left-handed, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Now, that is the only left-handed verse I found. Does, does anybody else know of a left-handed verse that I could not find? Okay, that's, yeah, that's the only one that I could find. So then I did wonder about being ambidextrous, and I found a verse. First Chronicles 12.2 seems to be talking about being ambidextrous. They were armed with bows and were able to shoot arrows or sling stones right-handed or left-handed. So they were able to use both, ambidextrous. When I was just out of high school, I moved to Washington, D.C., and I went to work for the FBI. I was not a special agent. <laughs> I wasn't even undercover. <laughs> oh, I worked 10 hours a day, and what I did at that time, because this was so long ago, when I would sit down at my desk, there was someone who would bring me stacks upon stacks upon stacks of fingerprint cards. And it was my job to go one by one and enter all of the information off of those cards into the computer. So looking at those, I got to see not only faces, because there were pictures on all of those cards, but I also got to see everyone's fingerprints. I, I didn't work there very long, only a few months for different reasons I left there. But in that time, I can't even begin to guess how many fingerprint cards I went through because, like I said, I did it for 10 hours a day. So it was a lot. <laughs> and, and we did have a quota that we had to meet each day and, and all of that. But it was very interesting to me that in all of those cards, nobody's fingerprints were the same. There are no two people in this world, in this world, with the same fingerprints. Turn your hand over. Look at your hand. Look at your, finger, look at your fingerprints. You know, look at the, the tips of your fingers. Nobody else's looks like yours. If nothing else, God knows you by your fingerprints. Now, we know he knows us in, in many more ways than that. But your fingerprints are uniquely yours. No one has them. Now, if you were living a life of crime, and you were living a life of serious crime, and you did not want to be detected by your fingerprints, you may cut them off, you may burn them off, you may disfigure them. And I saw all of that on the cards that I was looking at. I would often come upon cards where people had done things to try to destroy their fingerprints, tamper with their fingerprints. But your fingerprints are uniquely yours. 
when, you, when God says that you are wonderfully made, my, my, oh, my. We can't grasp that. We don't understand that. You know, we were formed out of dust. Adam was formed out of dust. You know, God, I don't know if he really did that, but, you know, formed him. His fingerprints, all of that. It's just, it's just amazing, amazing, amazing. Okay, so we have hands. We each have two hands in here this evening. Everybody has two hands. These hands serve us well. We need these hands. We make good use of these hands. We need these hands for physical work. God gave us these hands. He formed these hands. Not only did he form my fingertips, my fingerprints, but he formed my hands. I use these hands every day. I can't even imagine how many times a day I use these hands. How many times in my life I have done things with these hands. These hands are very important to me. They're very valuable to me. And they are to God as well. God gave us these hands for physical work. And I don't think that there would be anybody in here that would be surprised at that. Now, if we went out there and we started talking about that with some people, there'd be some people that were surprised that they were to be doing physical work. It seems nowadays it's very hard to get people to do physical work. But these hands were created for work. Proverbs 9.4, lazy hands make poverty. Proverbs 14.23, all hard work brings a profit. Are we to work? Absolutely. You know, God made the Garden of Eden beautiful, beautiful, detailed, full of life. And he gave it to Adam and then Eve as well. They weren't going to be able to just sit down and do nothing in that garden. He gave them that garden to take care of. Whether we like it or not, or whether we like to acknowledge it or not, physical work is good for us. Idle hands are not a good thing. Idle hands will get you into trouble. Idle hands are an idle mind, and it will, they will get you into trouble. These hands are for God's work, not only the physical work that it takes for our life to provide the things that we need, but these hands are for God's work. You know, I'm going to back it up because I did say I would make this interactive tonight. Does anybody have anything to say about, about physical work in your hands or anything like that? Okay. Okay, so God's work. Serving others. Colossians 3.23. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than people. Matthew 25.40. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. God's work. What does God's work look like? What is God's work? And if you want to talk, you can. <laughs> God's work is, is so vast. You know, I think it's... The dad shares this story. I know he does. He shares this story about um, the Mennonites that he used to work for and about how Mark Miller's children all went out and ended up work, going into different missions and things like that. And I think he's talked about the daughter, like, scrubbing toilets or something. Um, that's not a very... That's not something that we all want to do. It's probably something that any of us want to do. But you know, when you are serving God, you never know what you're going to be called to do. We look at social media and we see people in the 
in the mission field and we see people up on stages, we see people behind pulpits and podiums, we see people doing all kinds of work for the Lord, and a lot of what we see looks glamorous. It's not always glamorous. I know myself, for my dad and Anne, their ministry has not always been glamorous. They have helped people do things. They have gone to lice-infested homes and scrubbed and cleaned and washed. They have helped people move. They have fed people. They have, oh, they have built things. They have torn things out. They have cleaned. They have fed. I don't know that there's anything that, that my dad and Ann have not done to serve God and to serve others. It's not just putting on clean clothes and getting up here and speaking. It's the dirty, yucky, filthy, down on your hands and knees sometimes, breaking a sweat kind of stuff. That's part of ministry. And we're all called to ministry. We're all called to serve God. We're all called to serve others. And we have the hands to do it. So there may be times when you are doing something that is somewhat glamorous. But more times than that, you're probably going to be called to do something that is well below glamorous. If you truly want to serve God and you truly want to serve others. And lots of times you're down here on your hands and knees doing something for someone before you're up here. Rarely does God take you from here and put you up here. He takes you from here, puts you down here, and then raises you up. Because that's when you'll come up humble and willing and ready and able to use what he's given you to serve him and to serve others. And also, that's where you learn to relate. Because I wasn't up here when God found me. And the people out there that you're going to serve are not up here. They're down here. You have got to be down here in, a, in order to relate to them, to be able to relate to them. You've got to start down here. So if God wants you to help someone move or he wants you to feed somebody or he wants you to change a tire or he wants you to clean out a house, you do it. You say, yes, Lord. You just say, yes, Lord. Might not be what you want to do. Might not be doing it where you want to do it. And it might not even be in the time that you want to do it. But the quickest way to get from here to what you believe is up here because everybody's up here is different. So the quickest way is to just simply be obedient to God and to serve in the capacity that he calls you to serve in. Because then God will promote you. I don't know about you, but I don't want man's promotion. I want God's promotion. When God promotes someone, you know you're ready for it. Because he will enable you to be ready for it. Okay, do me a favor and flip your paper over. This is a little different tonight, and I hope you're okay with it. <laughs> okay. God gave us these hands to show love. Jesus broke the bread. Jesus served the cup. Jesus washed the feet. 
Jesus laid his hands on and took the hand of many. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, full of it. Full of it. Way too many scriptures for me to list. And I couldn't pick just one or two or three out. So if you doubt that Jesus laid his hands on and took the hand of many, or that he broke the bread, served the cup, and washed the feet, go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These hands are for service. These hands are to show love. If you're not a people person, you're not going to be a God person. You cannot be a God person if you are not a people person. Because what is God all about? Thank you. <laughs> people. <laughs> These hands are to reach out to people. Yes, thank you, Betty. <laughs> to reach out to people. These hands are to touch people. These hands are to wrap around people, embrace people. A touch on the shoulder, a shake of the hand, a hug. Embrace people, because I can tell you 150%, your ministry is people. If you wondered what your call was, if you wondered what your ministry was, it's people. That is your revelation for this evening. It is people. You've got to love them. You've got to embrace them. <laughs> Absolutely. Because in all honesty, everyone is not a people person. Truly. Everyone is not a people person. But people are your ministry. So... God will help you. Amen. He will make you a people person. He will give you the heart for them. If you ask him, he will give you the heart for people. He will help you to see them as he sees them. Yes. And he will help you to embrace them. And maybe you're not the kind of person who likes to hug. Extend a hand. Yeah. Not, every, not everyone likes to hug. And I'm not saying you have to go out and hug everybody. But there are times God's going to require you to give somebody a hug. Right. But, you know, a little pat, a little handshake, some warm words. We have to embrace people because they are our ministry. We have to show them God's love. Somehow, some way, we've got to show them God's love. And it has to be more than a word. Action. That saying, actions speak louder than words, that is so true. <laughs> That's true. It did not. It did not. They were, they were people just like we're people. You know, they, they weren't, you know, the, the day they met Jesus, they didn't just become holy. They were fishermen. When I think of fishermen, I think mm, a little rough around the edges. Their vocabulary probably needed cleaned up. Their stories probably needed cleaned up. Their actions probably needed cleaned up. Just like us. <laughs> They're just like us. <laughs> These hands are for transferring power. Transferring power. Transferring of power. The Holy Spirit 
a blessing, healing, and impartation. We've got a lot going on in these hands from God through us and out. Luke 4, 40. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. The Bible says, if there's any sick among you, call for the elders of the church. They will lay hands on them. Jesus laid hands and healed them. Jesus took them by the hand. Get up. You're healed. Numbers 27, 15 through 23. Then he, Moses, laid his hands on him, Joshua, and commissioned him as the Lord instructed. There was an impartation. Joshua was going to take over. Mark 10, 16. And he, Jesus, took the children in his arms, in his arms, <laughs> placed his hands on them and blessed them. Acts eight seventeen. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So many things coming through these hands. You meet up with someone. God puts someone in your path. Don't be afraid to put your hand on them. Because you don't know what's going to happen. Holy Spirit's within you. God is willing and waiting to move. Now, of course, you want to ask them first. Or they might lay their hand on you. But, you. but you do. You want to ask them first. But don't be afraid to put your hand on them. Because God's going to move through you. He's going to move through your hands. You're praying for someone to be made well. Go ahead. Lay your hand on them. That spirit is within you. That power is within you. Let it flow through you. Now, do you have to lay hands on them? You don't have to. But don't be afraid to. If you want to or you feel the Holy Spirit telling you to, don't be afraid to. Because more than likely, God will move through the laying on of hands. And there may be times where you take someone's hand or you touch them and you don't even have to pray. God just goes ahead and touches them without you even praying. And there may be times that God doesn't instruct you what to do until you've touched them. I know I've experienced that many times, that I, God wants me to go up to someone, and I don't know why until I lay my hand on them. And then he reveals to me what I'm to say or what I'm to pray or what I'm, what I'm to do. It's that connection. It's, 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 it's compassion in action. It's showing them your compassion. You're making contact with them. We are physical beings. And for some, some that can be hard. But most people crave a physical touch, physical connection. So when you touch someone... You are doing that. You're, you are touching them, but so is God through you. Compassion and action, showing forth, showing forth the love of God, not just speaking it, but showing it by your, by your touch, by your movement, what you do. Acts 
Kate, I'm going to use you for just one second. If I, I just, I, I hope it's okay. I meant to ask you beforehand, and I didn't get to. But I know the pastor prayed a father's blessing over you a couple weeks ago, and he didn't just have you come up and stand here and him stand back here, but he embraced you. He embraced you and prayed that blessing over you. He showed, he showed her a father's touch and a father's love and a father's embrace. I hope it was okay that I said that. (laughs) God's hands. Isaiah 42, 6. I can't put my glasses back on. Ooh, much better. Hoo-wee. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I don't know about you, but there are times and days where I need that. I need God to take me by the hand and keep me. When you think about, think about maybe when you have taken your child by the hand or you have taken your grandchild by the hand, why do you do that? Why do you take them by the hand? Sometimes you do it to keep them safe, to keep them from getting into something they shouldn't get into, to keep them from going somewhere where they shouldn't be going keep them from doing something they shouldn't be doing. So for all of those reasons and many more, God takes you by the hand and he keeps you. So when you need to know that he just cares for you or you need some comfort or you need a little direction or a little redirection, or a little balance, just picture him taking you by the hand and keeping you, him pulling you back and keeping you right by him. I always say, and I always pray this way, God, I do not want to lag behind you, and I do not want to get ahead of you. I want to be right beside you. And that's where I like my granddaughter when we're out and about. I like her right beside me because I can better control what she gets into and what happens. If you stay right beside God, he can better control what you get into, what he keeps you out of, and the direction in which you're going. So if you like that prayer, (laughs) to not lag behind, to not step ahead, but to stay right with him. Again, picture that he's got you by the hand. And Isaiah 41, 13, for I, the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. There are so many things to be fearful about. There are so many concerns and worries and upheavals. So many things and our lives happen in a day, in the course of a day. People to worry about. Things to take care of. We can get anxious. We can get overwhelmed. We can feel like we lack We can need some direction. We can need some stability. We can need some security. We can need some comfort. We can need some warmth. We can need our hand in his hand in his pocket. I love that. We can need that. And he says... 
do not fear, I will help you. Fear not, God will help you. He has got you by the right hand, and he will help you. John 10, 27 through 28. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can take them out of my hand. No one can take them out of my hand. God has got your hand, and there is nothing and no one that can take you out of his hand. You are his, and he is yours, and he's got you. Short of you choosing to walk away, you, your choice, your decision, no one is going to take you away from him. And even if you make that choice to walk away, God is still where you left him. He's not walking away. He's not turning away. He's right there. He's faithful. And he woos you. <laughs> he woos you. He'll leave the 99 <laughs> to go and bring back the one. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't always want to be that one that he's having to chase, that he's having to leave the 99 to go and bring me back. I want to be in with the 99. I want to be where I'm supposed to be, doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't want to let go of his hand. I want to hold it, and I want to hold it tight. We are in the potter's hands. Isaiah 64, 8, and I'm going to close with this. And again, I know tonight was a little different, a lot different, but thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> Isaiah 64, 8, we are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. God has you in his hand. And he is shaping you, and he is forming you. And sometimes you get a little lumpy and a little clumpy, and he dips his hands, and a little dry, <laughs> he dips his hands in the water, and he lovingly puts that water over you and reshapes you, reforms you, he is making you into something beautiful. You are on his potter's wheel, and he is shaping you into something beautiful. Let him do it. Let him have his way with you. If you are willing, if you would just pray this little short prayer I have written down here with me at the end. Our lives are the work of your hand, my life, every one of our lives. We pray that you shape us, mold us, make us however you will, God. Amen. 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 You are released.